welcome to the first vlog of 2024. I'm Laurie, this is Kick Spooks, and we are replicating the first vlog I made last year. Quite probably the only vlog I made last year, which is making a really strong start on putting down my TBR by reading the 10 shortest books on that TBR. So, the start of the year, my TBR stands at 160 books, which for some people isn't a lot, for some people is an unthinkable monstrosity. I'm starting to edge towards unthinkable monstrosity. It does give me a little bit of stress how many books I own and have not read. And I am really happy to be DNFing those books, smashing through those books. I just don't want them to sit there unloved and unknown much longer. So to find the shortest books on my TV, I went to my handy dandy trusty reading database, sorted all my books by to be read or finished then sorted by length. I felt like I had read some of these already, so I went to Storygraph to triple check that, took out the ones that I had read, and then I was left with these 10 books. Here they are in length order, and I am going to give you a little bit of a rundown of these books and what they're about. So here is my TBR, the top 10 shortest books I own. So, first of all, Kenko's A Cup of Sake Beneath Cherry Trees. This is a Penguin Little Black Classic, which means I've had it on my shelf for years, since I was a teenager. Uh, I think this is the last one of these I own that I haven't read. This is a collection of thoughts, poetry, musing from a Chinese philosopher. Not sure what era it's from. I'm going to do a little bit more research when I come to read this about the man, the myth, the legend. Then we have a Penguin Mini Modern. These were released maybe five years ago. And again, this is the last one from this collection that I own that I need to read. It's Dark Days by James Baldwin, which is a collection of three essays from various magazines um, from the 60s through to the 80s about queerness and race in America. And I have yet to find an American author I can stand. I know they're talking about very important things, but they make me want to claw my skin off. So I'm really hoping we found the exception to the rule. Then we've got a big stack all from the same publishers. These are the 404 Inkling series, where basically if you have an idea, you can write to this imprint, be like, hey, I want to do a little deep dive on this very specific topic, and they might let you. So these are all from 404. We have We're Falling Through Space, Doctor Who and Celebrating the Mundane by J. David Reed, which I think is going to look at those quieter moments of this vast history of Doctor Who and talk about how it relates to us as a people and why it resonates so strongly when we're just following normal people thrown into these fantastic situations. Then we have The Last Day Before Exile, stories of resistance, displacement and finding home. This is a collection of stories of people who have been displaced, why they've been displaced, what that journey is like and how to establish and integrate yourself into a new culture, a new home. I think this is a very timely piece of reading of what's going on in the world. I think it's going to inform me a lot more on those journeys that people take and I'm going to feel a lot more confident in starting those conversations with people and feeding this into my activism. Then we have Machine Readable Me, Hidden Ways Tech Shapes Our Identities by Zara Rahman. I have been thinking about this a lot recently, you know, working in an allied health profession, you are supposed to have no traceable online presence, and yet here I am. <laughs> but beyond the recording of our lives in a visible way, and who we choose to share that with, and if there is really enough security to choose who we share that with, thinking about the reverse of that, how we alter our lives to suit the technology, how it influences us, we all know we've done it. We all know we've fudged an Instagram post or a Goodreads goal. 
for that validation and I think this is really going to dive into that and it's something that I'm very interested in learning a bit more about. So it's a Christmas present, Whatever Next on Adult Adoptee Identities by a collection of authors Josephine Jay, Adeline Barra and Hannah Fabin smith All of these authors are adult adoptees who are either Chinese American or Chinese British talking about that intersection of identity um, of race, gender, sexuality and adoptee status and kind of the journeys and pitfalls of talking about that in online spaces. Then we have BFFs, whoops, The Radical Potential of Female Friendships by Anna Hitchberus. I think this is going to be what it says on tin, why in terms of activism we should be honouring those friendships and feeding our time, money, energy into those friendships. Then we've got two from a different publisher, it is my favourite publisher in the world, Charcoal Press, who translate South American lit in English. These are fairly backlist books I think, so they are Ricardo Romero's The President's Room, translated by Charlotte Coombe, which seems like very very short vignettes all about a room in everyone's home where the president can choose to stay whenever he likes. He has to have a room in your home, he has to be able to come and go as he pleases and how this family kind of navigate that thing that they never talk about and it just seems a bit creepy to be honest. Dislocations by Sylvia Malloy translated by Jennifer Croft is about the loss of a friend and I don't know if that's kind of through grief or through the gradual movement of time I'm not sure but it kind of talks about an estrangement of some kind and I think this is going to be a really good piece to read in conversation with kind of be thinking about friendship in quite an analytical way and then in quite a personal way. And then finally we have my first ever Fitzcarraldo Press book. It is Bonsai by Alejandro Zambra which is translated by Megan McDowell and this is a very brief again I think a series of vignettes around two literature students and how the books they share and read influence their relationship and it sounds like a really lovely way to start a year full of books. So I'm not sure what order I'm going to be reading these in, probably whatever order my hand touches them or whatever I fancy in the moment. Um, I'm certainly not going to be reading them from shortest to longest but hopefully in the next couple of weeks we can chip away at these and I'll share my thoughts with you as and when. So I was intending to kind of stop and give you updates every like third of the books or so and I realised these books are so short that it would just be crazy. So I have now finished BFFs, The Radical Potential of Female Friendship by Anna Heath Beruz and I absolutely loved it. I think overall I'm going to give it a 4.75. It just just wasn't a five star but it was so close and it was a really good way to start. I didn't realise when it said it was going to be a radical look at friendship it actually was talking about kind of how radical women invest in time in their relationships that are not for men is detrimental to capitalism. Women! And how women's time if it's not solely focused on child rearing and looking after their romantic partners, looking after their blood family does not contribute to the machine and how special that is and how we are socialised from such a young age to appear to be very friendly um, and kind of have our little girly gossip groups but actually there is a lot of kind of misogyny baked into that, a lot of self-hatred baked into that um, and how investing our time in these stories flips the script. It also helped me out with something that I've been struggling with for a really long time which is the guilt you feel as a woman when a friendship falls apart or ex-friends or lost friends or friends who just grow apart and kind of acknowledging that yeah it feels pretty crap when that happens but it happens in a system that it is designed to happen in and um, and that was really helpful for me to reflect on some relationships. They make literally an hour and a half. <laughs> I literally haven't even taken down the tripod. Um, I think we found him. The one good American author. <laughs> and like, 
You know when people say um, that authors capture the human condition? I've never understood what the hell that means. Now, I think I might understand what that means. Revolutionary, a very brave writer. Hmm. So we're looking at race and queerness in America of the 60s and then for the later essays in the 80s and looking at how very little has changed despite kind of civil rights movements, despite acts being put in place and amendments being made and the frustration that comes with living in a country that does not want you. I actually tabbed and quartered for the first time in my tiny little human life. Um, and what I was tabbing and quartering Sorry, I live next to a hospital. Call me Phoebe Bridges. He fixed it in time for me forever and he painted it, he said, for me. Just someone painting a scene for somebody else. The most romantic thing I've ever met, read perhaps. I wish you had heard him more clearly. An oblique confession is always a plea. But I was to hurt a great many people by being unable to imagine that anyone could possibly be in love with an ugly boy like me. I'm not saying word for word that's what my therapist said for me, but um, it's close to home. Talking about um, immigrants to America, not all necessarily African American, um, not all necessarily black. So thinking about um, the Irish community that moves in, the Italian community that moves in, passing Ellis Island on the boat to become a white American to kind of check in one identity for another. Later in the midnight hour, the missing identity aches. Palpable. So I have read another two of the four for England books. And they are so short that I quite like the format of coming back to tell you about two. Stop biting it. Dolly's favourite thing I do is to bite these books. The first one I've left in the car. <laughs> but you'll have seen a clip of it. It's Machine Readable Me. And I had really naively thought this was about social media. And kind of altering our identities. So people would like us online. And it's not about that whatsoever. It's absolutely not that think piece about social media is evil <laughs> is this how we're going to do the review babe it is about the ethics of biometrics and recording and storing people's biometric data i hadn't realized that gdpr was basically just a western europe thing but that actually makes a lot of sense um and so in a lot of places there are systems that go out of their way to catch collect store data, particularly biological data, with no reason. So there was this example of Germany where when you get like the citizenship card they ask if you want to submit your fingerprint and then they were like <laughs> Why? And they were like there's literally no reason, it's just in case it's ever useful in the future. Whereas like that wouldn't apply in the UK. Like you've got to have a reason to hold that data. Um, and also talk about other countries like India, and kind of how ethnic cleansing can be carried out using that data and how basic rights can be withheld from certain ethnic groups in countries based on that data and how it's often unsafe for us to tell the truth in that data collection for example if you are LGBTQ plus in a country that is not chill with that you can't let them collect that data and also those identities can change over time as we learn and grow and experience new things and that's all lovely but also our physicality can change and grow. So say you have this finger stored on a database and that's what gives you access to all of your country's systems and kind of welfare and then your finger is amputated. Like, <laughs> what are you going to do? What are you going to do? Or even if you kind of um, have some kind of accident or you work in really demanding physical labour, your fingerprints can get worn off. Like, I didn't know that was a thing. Fascinating. Uh, I absolutely love this book. I gave it four stars um, just because it was getting too big brain for me at some points. The other book, if Dolly will allow me to retrieve it, 
Last Days Before Exile, Stories of Resistance, Displacement and Finding Home by Selen Bakak. This was what I expected it to be. That it took case studies of certain people who were all involved in um, kind of artists' collectives and were willing to share their stories and it looked at kind of the run up to them being exiled, the life they had to leave behind and also kind of the impact that had on them and it looked at that thought process of am I ever going to get home, am I even going to try or am I going to build this new life here? Were they really even intended to be in exile or were they just kind of leaving the country for a couple of days? All the people in here are artists but also there are politicians and kind of um, activists and things like that. So I think this is a really important read, especially at the moment, given, I mean, gestures at the world. So today we're going somewhere. I've been wanting to go since we moved back to the northeast. Um, we're going to a place called Barterbox in Annick. It is like the only place I've found, locally at least, where you can trade in books. It's not really a thing in the UK like it is in the US. Um, so I've got a big ass box of books. And I'm gonna go and trade them in and buy some more books. <laughs> it's mostly Doctor Who books and books that I didn't like, but are signed. So, hello Dolly. Let's see what we can get for them. <laughs> so, for our pile of tatty old books, how much did they give us, Jesse? They give us. Pounds. English pounds. English pounds, not Scottish. Not Scottish, English pounds. Um, and we've spent 40 of them and we'll do a little haul when we get in the car. Back in the tatty box. Back in the tatty box. Tatty box. Tatty box. Tatty box. Right, I've been in studious mode. Studious. Studious with the glasses. What's in the box? What's in the box? We Put your hand, hand in the box. Ah, we've traded in so many books to get far back. Oh, Jesse's Lauren's pick. pick. Something about The Simpsons that cost most of our voucher. Shock. It cost a fiver. It's got lots of Simpsons facts in it. And then... Oh, the hottest thing Jesse has ever done in their life. The miners. One union. One industry. Down. The, the mines. mines! You can put that over the actual. Yeah, sure. I've got the ability to do that. Oh, then a pick for me. Um, a little book of Northumberland folklore, which I will use for writing. Because um, sometimes I do that. <laughs> sometimes. And I speak. Not often enough, clearly. Last one. A little Ruth Azeki, um time code of a face where she basically looks at herself in a mirror for three hours and writes down everything she thinks about. Um, what would you write about? God, I fucking hate all those chins. <laughs> are we going to Alec or are we going home? Go home. Go home. You want to play Fortnite? Oh, I don't play Fortnite. You, want, you love playing Fortnite. I've never played Fortnite in my life. I'm a Minecraft girlie. Before we even start, I want you to look at this whole shelf of Doctor Who books. This is like not even half the Doctor Who collection until very recently. I want you to look at this and remember for the cow how much I must like Doctor Who to have all these damn books. I'm gonna make a controversial statement. It's okay not to like your favourite things, or like not to like everything about your favourite things. I know, Dolly. It would be really nice just to see a balanced critique of this show. I feel like everyone is either 100% in or 100% out, or like, will, because it's a show that has eras, like, they get really territorial about their favourite eras. And like, I love most facets of most eras of Doctor Who, but I can 
like break them apart and I can say like, the acting was really good in that season but the writing wasn't it or like that plot didn't quite work but like this like the sets and the costume no you've got to be all in you've got to be all in I gave it three stars it was very surface level it was very like oh look a companion this is what they teach the doctor Plot twist how to be human. <laughs> so it's like exactly what I thought it was going to be before I even picked it up. Um, and yes, I did tab some little bits. But <sighs> I feel like there was nothing in here that I hadn't already read a million times in Twitter discourse. And I feel like if you're going to pick up this book, you've been a fan for a while. You've been in the trenches with me. So from that three star piece of nonsense to a five star piece of wonderful nonsense. Bonsai by Alejandro Zambra, which is translated from Spanish by Megan McDowell. And it's, there's barely anything there to this book, to be honest. But there's loads there because, 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 um, this feels like a trickster god is recounting to you a story of these two people who end up in a relationship because they both lie about having read the same book at a house party um, and then when that gets revealed to you that neither of them have read it it kind of sets the tone for this rug being pulled out from under you all the time so something will happen and they'll say oh but it didn't or like they'll say something that directly contradicts it and it happens so much with such a short book and it gives you such an insight into what the characters tell the people around themselves and why, like why they want people to have that reaction to them. And it was just amazing, it was amazing, it was really really good. It kind of felt a little bit existential even though Dolly has put her ass on the play button for YouTube. The main character does lots of odd things and kind of picks up odd obsessions. Miss, your ass is not that fat. So he picks up this obsession with um, lying about translating a book for a famous author who didn't end up taking up the services but he's told everyone so he goes along with it um, and also learning how to look after bonsai trees and for such a short book it's really strange how it has these wandering kind of tangents and deviations and we really enjoyed it didn't we Dolly? Yes. Yeah so you get that. Because you filled the shop, another thingy comes out, or oh, upside down, my bad. Look at my Scooby Doo Playmobil. The best bit. What's in the cloche? Oh no. Oh. It's a donut and some sausages, isn't it? Oh, he's had a hard life. So, on adult adoptees is what I decided to read in the end. And I hadn't realised all the authors had been adopted from China to either the UK or the US. Um, which gave kind of another aspect to thinking about that adoptee journey. Because you've also got, like, the birth mother journey to, like, go back to a country you don't know but that you're technically from. But you don't have any connection to and that was quite interesting but I think having three authors with very similar experiences it was nice to see the subtle nuances between them but they were all talking about the same thing in each of the chapters so, like they'd all do a chapter on one thing so you were reading the same chapter three times and um, I did find it really repetitive but I'm really glad it exists for the people who could use that I feel like a lot of the points were kind of like these are the unhelpful narratives we get told about adoptions um, and the bad. And it kind of didn't really go beyond that or suggest other narratives that would be more beneficial for people to explore or if this was a jumping off point, didn't necessarily... It had references to other works, but it didn't really guide you on that journey of how to develop your knowledge of that area. Um, so I think overall I'll give it three stars. It was still good. I'm happy it exists clearly wasn't for me <laughs> but was useful for me to expand my knowledge a little bit and then plot twist i oh <laughs> i also read kenko's get the title right for once 
a cup of sake beneath the cherry trees and um, it was a post confusion piece of self-help basically it was great it was quite funny a lot funnier than i expected it to be i suppose it's always something quite nice that something that old represents people exactly like you know them to be so people have always squabbled over money life love worried about death and i think it, it's nice to have that humanity that like no matter when you were from or where you were from we were all worried about the same stuff and like nothing ever changes the backdrop changes if that hello you once again join me in my car on a lunch break in a picnic spot which i think is kindly named it's actually a lay-by and <laughs> in today's lay-by we can see some fly tipping of the flavour of a clothes horse and a tree which is apparently electric let's talk about a book <laughs> so we are at last going to talk about the last book in this vlog it's dislocations by sylvia malloy and this one is translated by Jennifer Croft. It broke me. Uh, here's a pro tip. If you have an aging grandparent uh, in a dementia specialist home and you feel guilty that you are not in the home holding their hand 24 seven, because that's not sustainable. You're supposed to be looking after yourself, but you still feel like you should. And people have been telling you you're not used to that word should because that's bad for your mental health, but you should be going to see your grandma in the home a bit more than you are if that's you and that's not just me because surely that's a global experience don't read this book <laughs> do not read this book it will damage you it <laughs> right okay let's start again let's bitch let's start again this book is about an unnamed narrator who is visiting their friend who is suffering from something that looks very much like a dementia, Alzheimer's. Um, that kind of presentation where she is slowly losing her memory um, in unexpected ways and she's starting to notice these huge pits of memory that aren't there. And it's just told in tiny little vignettes, almost like thoughts, um, that this narrator is having as she visits her friend in this home. And I love that it wasn't like this selfless, introspection about everything that these two people had gone through together it was a very real representation of actually i'm a bit of a shit person because we're all kind of shit people um and here is my temptation to retell you a story from your life as if it's new because i am here every day i've got nothing new to tell you but you've lived a life that was real interesting why can't I just give that back to you in a repackaged way? Or, he's a story that we experience together, but I'm going to recast myself in a better light. Because, again, I'm a human, and I don't like owning to the fact that I did terrible things. And you won't remember, and you also can't even tell anyone, because you're not going to remember this. I'm not saying I've done those things. But when you're in a visiting room, the temptation is so real. And like this narrator unburdens herself of like some of the things that have kept her really guilty um, in her life, knowing that she's not going to have a reaction to that because this woman doesn't really know who she is anymore, but she gets to tell her best friend in the world the things that have haunted her. And she also finds out that her friend had secrets as well that she told to other people. Um, and now she can't confront her about that because she doesn't even remember the secret that lawn telling another person and was she in the right mind when she told that person did she know who they were or was that just again a body to tell a secret to who was there and she didn't think she'd ever see them again it was really really genius i think the only reason i didn't give it five stars was because it hurt me <laughs> but the more i talk about it the more i think i should revise that star in because I was thinking like, oh, I don't want to give all these five stars at the start of the year. <laughs> like, that's a lot of pressure. I'm... It's five stars. Executive decision, five stars. Um, 
if you are a translation fan, if you, you know, would like to work through some of your thoughts in a masochistic way, if you are struggling with a family member who's going through this, this is the one for you, I guess. Um, if you are a mentally well person and would not like to do that to yourself, avoid it. Hello, it's Ed and Lauren, uh, who has just realised I was so traumatised in the retelling of my review about dislocations. I didn't tell you about my other charcoal press book, which was The President's Room by Ricardo Romero. I've got it here. Um, <laughs> this was also a big old four-star book. The entire concept of the President being entitled to come into your home without you ever knowing, like you don't have to know he's there and quite often you probably don't it creates this kind of liminal space in that room that you never know if someone has lived in or not but also the fear that someone very powerful could be moving around your house while you are asleep and you don't know is really creepy and then as the child accidentally starts to see him the president doesn't kind of see him back so again we've got this otherworldly not connected to the things that happen around us kind of sense and you've also got then that theme of authoritarianism being vigilant inside the home secrets being kept from family members in the home things that you do not speak about because you are more loyal to this mystery creature than to your family and like creature is the right word this man is a cryptid when the kid starts to see him It, it, it's described almost like he's wearing a fake nose, like you know those fake nose and glasses. Um, and I find those particularly scary because, for whatever reason, my prepubescent brain heard the story of O.J. Simpson escaping in one of those fake noses, um, and it's like never released the fear. <laughs> O.J. Simpson was gonna go murder me. That's so stupid. Um, but I do now have a uh, fear of those because I do think that they are only worn by murderers. He's a cryptid, but in the same way that O.J. Simpson has become a cryptid in my mind. The only reason I didn't give it five stars is because once he was noticed by the president and you had that connection, the story ended. And there was no kind of unpacking of that secrecy in the home or breaking those rules. Um, Oh, kind of come to terms with it. It was just really severe, and I understand that's probably genius. But I need to know if I'm in danger from this little creepy man. <laughs> Back to past Lauren. Well, once again, this has proved to be a really good challenge for me to do at the start of the year. Not only is that itch at the back of my brain of like reducing my team yeah, scratched off, um, because. I've got through 10 books and that's such a strong, strong mood for me. And then parallel to that, what you haven't seen is my car audiobook reading has produced maybe the best book I've ever read and it was an 800 odd page book that I would never have picked up if I hadn't been cracking through so many short books. You'll hear about that in a wrap up at some point. Overall, that is four books in the kind of three to four range, three books in the four to five range and three books three books in the five star range i had a lovely time <laughs> thank you for joining me on this little vlog i will hopefully have another vlog coming for you soon all about reading cozy fantasy because i'm still in the vibe i'm still in the mood it is still overcast and gray we need the warmth and the comfort to get us through so keep your eyes peeled for that hope you get some lovely reading done and i will talk to you again very very soon bye